So we're gonna. I am the Wyden. You're, yeah, this is Rennie Gleason yeah. Wyden. <laughs> Well, uh, actually, I do. I, by the way, as, as this thing is firing up, I do. I found really interesting a lot of Mark's points, and I, I do actually agree the whole concept of the agency. Uh, I don't know that I'd word it exactly that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the agency not being special, um, but I do believe that the the where he took that that it's all about the culture and about the people. I completely agree. We actually, when when Mark came out of the office, it, I don't know if he told you this, but. When, when he first visited, we walked around, and the first thing we looked at was all the people. And one of the things that you know a lot of agencies do is the first thing they show is all the work. Oh, look at all the right. all the work that we've done. But for us, you you don't get that work without the people. Uh, and one of the things that we've found is that not only is that important on the agency side, but it's incredibly important on the client side. And we've actually had a couple of clients who have said to us, "Hey, we'd like you to expand the portfolio of brands you guys are working on. Right. What categories would you like to work in?" And we were like, "Well, what?" We can work in any category, but we need to meet who we're going to work with. Because that relationship, right. not only the sure. people who are working and the talent that's thinking about it, but yeah. literally the relationship is so it's, critical. It's yeah, yeah. I was, uh, you know, speaking of people, I when I was at uh, Nike, it was like 92 to 96, and I did some I work with Wyden. And the, my first visit over to the Wyden office in the old building, there's two things that I remember from that very clearly. One is they had photos of all the people prominently displayed. So clearly people were important to, uh, their people were important to Wyden. The other one was this, I think they had just had a birthday party for Dan Wyden and it was, always this, a mess. it was this uh, tombstone and it said, you know, Dan, he said, Dan Wyden, he's old. <laughs> But not as old as Kennedy. That's so that was that, that was that is that that's uh, too uh, fair to say. Yes, I will. Uh, I will always remember that. So uh, I just w also want to thank everybody here for showing up. First year, kind of a new concept. Or um, uh, part of part of this is I used to work on the Portland Creative Conference and C.J. Glazer, who you can't see, but is back there um, uh, making everything tick for this show. Uh, used to run the Portland Creative Conference with a number of great board members. So it's great to kind of bring a format like this back to Portland, and the goal is that this grows and that we, unlike the Creative Conference, uh, we. This, the, for this event, really work on bringing people from out of town for this period of time. Uh, so this first year, we did it for Portland, but the goal is as this grows, we get more and more people from outside of Portland to network with all of you, and interesting things will happen, I think. Cool. So we're close. All Do right. you want to send a signal out there? Send a signal out there? Send a signal out your, there? Your video out. Uh, Dave, you want to go ahead and bring up the stage computer? We'll, we're oh. good. Rennie Gleason. Thank you. All right. First off, thank you. Um, very excited to be here and has been such a blast. Um, I always love hanging out with Mark and, and those guys. And I don't know, did you get the intro to Mark? Did, did you share the Henry Rollins story? Uh, no. Okay. So. Henry Jenkins, I, I said that Henry referred to Henry Jenkins. He's good. He converges. But Henry Rollins. Rock star. Um, Mark, little known fact, I'll let him give you the full detail on it. Uh, the story starts out with Mark. You've seen him walking around. Imagine Mark, Christmas Eve, Amsterdam, freezing cold, just a little after midnight, stumbling down, snowy road, and all of a sudden, out from behind him, a uh, door opens up and it's Henry Rollins, spills out onto the street, shorts, t-shirt, bottle of water, loaf of bread. <laughs> I'll let him tell the rest of it. It's good. <laughs> so, um, it, and th this is going to be interesting because I can see we're, we're going to be sort of interactive with the actual screen space. Uh, how the I had a really interesting conversation with the creatives because I, I come at this with a little bit of a messianic zeal, uh, which I think a lot of interactive folks tend to be a little bit guilty of, and. We, a, a lot of what we do is try to translate. There's, there's just so damn much happening literally every day that I know, and this is what I tell everybody there, I know I'm out of date 
by the time I get to the office every single day. I know that if I go to Mashable, I'm going to see 70 plus uh, browser tools that aren't Firefox. I'm going to see 100 plus new plugins for WordPress. I'm going to see, uh, you know, fill in the blank. There's just so much happening all the time that e even I'm out of date and, and I'm plunged in the middle of this. So uh, trying to work with everybody, client agencies, uh, my family, uh, to help them understand what in God's name I do and, and what we do is, is both exciting but it can also be a little challenging. And so the creative directors gave me this little pamphlet. It was fantastic. It was, it's just so, uh, what, what I love about what we do about wideness. There's, sort of the, there's this craft quality, there's a, a, a breaking quality, there's a lot of different things. So he handed me this book and he said, so how do we build brands in the postmodern digital media world? And he, what he was trying to do was help me sort of understand where uh, some of the questions that they had come from. So I thought this would be actually kind of an informative process given what Josh was talking about and Mark was talking about. So here's, here's how advertising used to work, right? You normally get the folks who kind of say, well, there were a th three channels and there were a thousand, there's a micro fragmentation and everything dissolving. Okay, so you start off, there's, there's your idea, and typically that would come out of some, you know, the significant, interesting process that develops the idea. Then you would take media and you would pound it into your skull <laughs> until you created the desire for the product. I tried to summarize the history of advertising in one slide. I'll let you drink that in for a moment. You've all lived it. So now, and, and this was the nature of this discussion, he goes, so, so now, I get, he goes, I get it. There's, there's movies, whenever you want, all of your music, anytime, and you know, iPod announcing, they aren't calling it the Y-Pod, but effectively uh, mobile download for, for your music content. He goes, maps, maps out your ass, robot cars and phones and GPS devices that decode the earth for us. And now, I don't know if you've seen this yet, there's actually a flight simulator, so you can fly over Google Earth and look up at the sky and, Fucking cool. I thought it was a brilliant summary for me. And by the way, over the course of the presentation, if you can pick up the subtle product placement that I try to incorporate uh, into this. Um, it, and this is where he, he goes crazy. And this one is a doozy. All the information you ever want, ever, whenever, instantly, movie times, ingredients, historical data, my favorite, photos of celebrities naked, uh, frighteningly up to the minute news and local events. You've got people, every time you turn on the news and you see an auto accident, who are these idiots with their mobile phones standing next to it? Snapping? They're all out there. So it gets more comprehensive. It's faster. It's every day. Now, th this is my favorite, the I can't believe I have to buy another one, which is what, they, what Apple just rolled out. Here's the, the, you know, they're calling it something else, but I, I think that pretty much captures it. You know, here's this entire experience. Now, uh, uh, or you could get the Nokia N95. Nokia, client, that more product placement. But just a, a, little, a little breath in there. And so he says, how does it change what we do? Because, and, and this was where, Mark was talking about sort of all, all the different points about now, now consumers involved in it. And this is where I do get a little bit messianic. I had a, a, a conversation uh, at work about punk rock. The internet and punk rock. Is, is the internet the new punk rock? Would you agree? Is the internet the new punk rock? Hands up if you think the internet is the new punk rock. A few, a few folks. A lot of classic music fans. Okay. Uh, is the internet, I, I thought that there were certain components to the internet that, that feel punk rock. There's a do-it-yourself aspect. There's a little anarchy uh, involved with, with what we do. But I think that's that an enormously reductive uh, and facile statement to make about what is actually happening. Um, punk rock was something that you could uh, enjoy or not enjoy. You could be a music fan and not be a punk rock fan. I don't know how you could be interested in propagating ideas and not be involved in the interactive space. Fundamentally, what, what is happening is you have a rewiring of not only the, the, the brains and culture, but the body politic. There's so much happening. So that was the, we had a very uh, spirited conversation, as you can imagine, about that. So, how, but how does it change? Here was the old model. You had the brand sitting over here on the left. You had the consumer helplessly awaiting their product on the right. And in the middle, you had the agency. Now what the agency did was it, it helped 
They, they were a consumer advocate in the process. They helped a brand, which was very often focused on their products, which is what they should be focused on. Um, they would help them take those products, which can be a little wonky when you get the engineers and product people talking about it, uh, and they translated. Here's the agency. We understand what the consumers are doing. We're, we're in their space. We understand the sort of pop culture landscape that this stuff is going to uh, be dropping into. And so effectively, we're a translator or a uh, mediator of some kind. But our job is to help those two speak in a common language that ultimately creates an engagement. And the argument is now that this is what it looks like. So the, the three have merged gently into this car wreck, um, which is uh, this, this new landscape that we're in. And so to the topic, the subject that I popped, Tai Zon Day. I find Tai Zon Day to be a wonderfully illustrative example of what's happening right now from a user-generated content standpoint, from the phenomenon of brands being created online. And the thing that boggles me also is I'm, sure, I'm going to have to throw the whole damn presentation away in a week because there's going to be another one. But for anybody who hasn't seen Tai Zon Day, and you are the poorer for it if you haven't seen Tai Zon Day, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to pop if we've got a connection here. It should come up. Ty, uh, here from his own website, so we know it's true, Ty Zonday's unique voice is frequently compared to Barry White, uh, I had some good ones, uh, James Earl Jones, and, and here he is, Chocolate Rain. Nice promotion there. What is he saying? It doesn't matter. He moves away so that his breath won't impact the quality of the recording. Okay. Thank you, Ty. So we're going to give we're going to give Ty a break. Now, I, I think what's important here is as I was trying to capture this the magnitude of what Ty Zonday has become, I had to change the presentation three times in the course of the last 12 hours. He is now at it's probably a little hard to read from back there, uh, 8.345 million views, of which almost a half million came between last night and this morning. I'm also going to show you a brief clip, because this is the one that actually made, my, made me wet myself. The, the other one was amusing. Rennie, this I, one, think, yeah. I think the increase in views is because your topic for this uh, conference was named, you, know, uh, you put his name in it. So clearly it a driver. Boosted his traffic. Thank you all. From, yes, thank you. <laughs> so now, thank you. listen, can we turn up the sound? Is there a little more? You can blow your mind like they were David Blaine. <laughs> I, I think you get it. So, <laughs> thank you, Ty. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is Ty is huge. Ty has developed an enormous following, and I'm not going to show you the enormous raft of other responses that Ty has gotten. There is, for everybody familiar with Chad Vader? Chad Vader, thank you. Can you describe Chad Vader? Uh, Chad Vader, he goes to their collection. Yes. It's a guy who dresses up like Darth Vader, and he works in a convenience store, or a store, and he has a series. It's quite well produced. It's very, and he actually has some of Darth Vader's powers, if I'm not mistaken, but, <laughs> but very compromised. Very, very compromised. So Chad Vader has done Chocolate Rain, and it is hysterical. Um, there, there are so many calls and responses uh, to this piece of content. Um, 
that it, what it's done is it's created an entire community around itself. Jimmy Kimmel um, had him perform live. They have a little segment, uh, uh, Internet Stars, and they had uh, Ty Zonday. By the way, how old do you think Ty Zonday is? Uh, 25, okay, yes. He is actually a fully grown individual. Um, his voice sounds exactly like he, or when he, his speaking voice, he uses exactly this very deep sort of bass uh, voice. And he's on Jimmy Kimmel. And that moment for me was a very uh, uh, indicative one because here's this guy who's blown up on the web. Eight and, almost eight and a half million people have now watched this video. And he's on Jimmy Kimmel and he's playing with his keyboard, which clearly he loves. That's the keyboard right over there. Um, and he play, he's focused. I mean, the kid is focused. And he performs and you watch the audience. And that is where it gets priceless. The audience is like this. <laughs> they have no idea what to make of it. Is this real? Is this not real? And, and that gets us to an interesting point with why is it, right? We, when we, we look, we have a lot of clients who come to us, they get this interactive marketing checklist. Oh, I, I need to have a social network. I need to have a mobile strategy. I need a location-based strategy. I need uh, viral. My, my favorite is the, well, I've got, I've got a little money left in the budget. Let's do viral. <laughs> Um, the, only, the only problem with that is you need an idea before you do that. And what, what, makes, uh, what makes something viral is very hard to predict. If it wasn't uh, uh, hard to predict what people would like and forward around, then there wouldn't be movies that suck. And there are. Uh, I go to many of them. Uh, so so the, the, viral, the component of viral, there, there's this sort of wonderful uh, interplay with, with people and what they like and what they don't like. And it's, it's hard to predict. I, I would venture to say that Ty Zonday would be one of, the, one of the case studies where people would say, well, here's user-generated content generating 8.5 million plays. Uh, Monday Night Football generates 9 million views on a weekly basis. Therefore, is this a more viable uh, medium to communicate? I would argue that Ty Zonday, um, and bless his heart if he's in the audience, m my apologies, uh, the concern I have is that uh, Ty Zonday to me is a little bit, there's a little, um, well, it's like a car wreck. As you, you're, you're driving by, you can't not look. I, I, I don't think that people, when they're listening to that music, are going, my God, why don't I have this in my collection? Where, how could I have missed this? Where, Spin Magazine, what's going on? Ty Zonday, clearly you've missed it. So there's, there's that component, and the trick for agencies, one of the many tricks for agencies and brands, uh, is trying to figure out how do you leverage this thing? What, what can, how do you play in this space in a way that isn't sort of leveraging schadenfreude, but actually after you've moved eight and a half million uh, video plays, can you actually sell a product? Now, I, I give you a point, counterpoint with Ty Zonday, uh, if you've heard of Marie Digby, uh, and this one broke uh, just yesterday, if you get heard about the Marie Digby thing. So there's a phenomena called the YouTube phenomena, where unknown, unsigned people have an opportunity to enter into the creative space and create their products and be found in this meritocracy of ideas. But it's just wonderful. There, there is that component to it. But Ty Zonday, for me, is the example of, you know, CAA is now out scouring uh, YouTube and all these sites trying to find talent. So here comes Marie Digby, a uh, young, young woman uh, who plays acoustic guitar. I'll actually show you, here's one of her, uh, if I get this up, one of her heartfelt uh, acoustic sessions. So she, uh, she did the MySpace thing. She goes on to MySpace, she's got her page. Hey, everybody out there, I'm a struggling young musician, I'd love to, love to get out there. She puts a couple of her, uh, oop, a couple of her uh, songs, which she, she does, um, you know, there, and she, what she's doing is she's, uh, this is classic, classic YouTube, video webcam, up a little too close, how, you know, the camera angle not quite right, so it feels very handcrafted. Well, the big news was that uh, about a month ago, or a couple weeks ago, Hollywood Records signed this new YouTube phenomena. You, the people, have created Mar Marie Digby. Uh, we're, gonna, we're just gonna give her that helping hand that she's earned. The only problem was she'd signed with Hollywood Records 18 months before. And so what they did was they very smartly 
said, hey, how do you, how do you create a new act? What do you do? Well, there's this cultural construct that we have of the YouTube phenomenon, exploding new talent, bang, Marie Digby. She's awesome. I don't fault her for the, uh, for the um, approach. There was, uh, the issue was there was a little bit, you could argue it's a little disingenuous. Lord knows we're never that in advertising. <laughs> I, I just want to offer you a distinction between what she does and what we do. So, uh, the, and the trick here, and I grabbed a, a quote off her page. So this is um, a, a recent blog post on her MySpace page, which came uh, just before uh, the article broke uh, yesterday on Marie. It says, when I walked into the studio on my own, it was the first time I saw the engineers wandering around. I sat there in awe. Uh, I couldn't believe, you know, I cut it short, but my fingers were shaking. I couldn't believe all these people were running around little old me. Well, they'd already been running around little old her during the sound check that they'd probably done several months ago. So it is interesting. You sort of, you have these phenomenons happening and you already have these phenomenons being leveraged. So when, when we look at the space, uh, we, Widen and Kennedy, we try to overlap with other slides so that they're hard to read. Um, we, we try to focus on a couple buckets. Uh, presence, brand distribution, social extension, immersive experiences, mobility, uh, social currency, and story dwelling. And what I'm hoping to do is uh, give you a, a, a sort of quick uh, intro to each one of those and how we approach them. Any questions so far? That all makes sense? So presence, what, when we talk about presence, this is the really interesting thing. I had um, a uh, financial company, an investor, a VC firm, uh, pose the question to me, when will the dollars move from display advertising into social media? It, for real, because there's a still large chunk, you, you, it's hard to go wrong with a Yahoo homepage from a visibility standpoint. And so there still are these, you know, what, what we painted ourselves a little into a corner interactively by saying, yeah, we can measure everything. So now you have these vast uh, CPM networks and uh, enormous uh, buys going on. But when will the dollars move into these more interest interesting, uh, more engaging forms of media? And my answer to, the, to that person was, and this is a little circuitous, but second life to me is, is a fascinating exercise, whether you love it or you hate it. What was for us interesting about it was that the brands that did it uh, successfully, we think, doesn't matter how much traffic they got or, or, or where they, you know, what, what actually happened there, people flying around or having sex or throwing uh, phalluses at them. Um, what they got was an introduction to the fact that you aren't a moment in time. A brand is not a moment in time, that by entering the social networking space or any of these deep engagement spaces, you are starting a relationship. Brands that missed the point, cut it off, walked away, said that doesn't work, they'll be putting all their stuff into, you know, CPM based buys on broad banner networks. The ones that got it go, oh wait a second, we're not actually structured to do this. Brands aren't structured to do it. There's nobody at, on, on the client side who's sitting around going, it, managing yet the sort of ongoing dialogue with consumers that the interactive uh, space allows them. Similarly, the agencies, where the, the whole structure, agency-client relationship, is something that has emerged sort of dripping from the Jurassic slime with, you know, oh, this silo, this silo, this silo. It's one of the reasons actually why I came to Widen Kennedy. I was originally uh, at Kara. God bless them, great company. Uh, clearly the poorer for me leaving, um, but the <laughs> silos that they had made it very difficult to deliver on the kind of synergy, the, the promise of synergy, because you actually, it's, while it's a company, it's actually sort of a consortium of acquisitions and, and it's challenging to make it work. So, brands having a dialogue. Here, this, this slide is meant to show you, um, these are all the ways you can reach me. These are my active uh, uh, social interaction points online via mobile, so I'll start top left, Ning. Uh, that is not actually a picture of my family, I put it there for irony. Um, the, I have a Ning social network for my family though that I created in you know, 11 minutes. There's my LinkedIn profile, uh, my MySpace page, the 
cat is ironic. Uh, my Skype, uh, Gmail, Yahoo, here's the mobile device. It's in my pocket that I use for mobile blogging, for Twittering, uh, et cetera. I have set up a G group, Wyden and Kennedy G group. There's my Facebook page, my Ouroboros blog, my Basecamp, my Twitter, uh, and my AIM, my instant messaging tool. Uh, I also included, as I started thinking about all these different points where people can contact me, I had to include my, of course, my email account uh, that, that I use for work. And then it started to get crazy. Because I'm like, wow, well, does my Flickr account, do I include that? Uh, I look at photos, I'm not really using that for social purposes. Do, and, and when you start to branch into it, you actually realize that there are so many different points of personality. All this to say that the same exists for brands. And when you go into the interactive space, you have to be thinking about how consumers expect this. Your customers are expecting to be able to reach you, to talk to you, to have a meaningful relationship. They don't care whether it's on the side. Uh, we're talking with Mark. If I'm, uh, if I'm trying to reach Spider-Man, I don't care if it's on the side of a cereal box, if it's in a comic book, if it's in a movie, if it's on my Game Boy Advance, if it's online. That is Spider-Man. And if you screw up, if you give me a disjointed Spider-Man experience at any one of those points, you've, you've taken a brick out of my brand experience for Spider-Man. So these, as we, as we talk with brands, and this is any agency that tells you that they get this is lying to you. Any client that tells you they've got the answer to this is lying to you because we're all trying to figure it out. It's really exciting and a real pain in the ass. Because so, you have to think about how, how are you going to maintain this thing. I've, I've got uh, here, on, on my Facebook page, I, I, I had um, updating the presentation. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to get my Facebook page in 12 hours. So I just I put up, I'm, I'm wondering who you are. It's just it's for whoever comes to the page. It's, you, you find, though, that there is a, there's an investment that you make in presence. Presence is the nature that you are now always on, that brands are always on. And what does that mean? Uh, and then I just included Blip TV. You guys have probably all seen Justin TV. The, I mean, these are all sort of contact points where I can sort of mediate a little bit. The Justin TV, which is virtually invisible here, is, is the concept. You've got a couple of guys walking around with cameras. Literally, you can watch them all day. So the second concept we talk about is brand distribution. In the interactive space, seven years ago, it was okay to have a brochure site. It's not okay now. In fact, you, you go to those things, the, the smell of a neglected blog or a neglected site is you can you can you can you, you comes through the, the ethernet as you're going in so we talk about how do you get your brand not just as a destination how is your campaign not trying to drive everybody to another place to hear what you've got to say there but how do you bring your brand out to where they are so this is I'm going to give you some examples of Nike here was the Nike ID billboard that went up in Times Square you could uh, use your mobile device to SMS uh, message if anybody's used the Nike ID store you can customize your uh, Nike sneaker a couple of different colorways and, and designs and you can have it shipped to you so this turned a billboard into that storefront uh, iTunes music there's an entire sport music section that has popped up as a result of the, the Nike Plus running tool. Uh, this was the crop circles that they did across uh, England for the rollout of free. This was the Wayne Rooney uh, execution when uh, England, which had basically no chance, was going to the World Cup. Uh, Rooney was viewed sort of as the uh, 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 embodiment of all that was good for football for the team so they, they turned this we we did a campaign with him uh, with the cross of St. George across, painted across him. it was a very uh, interesting provocative image and it turned into uh, a huge uh, groundswell people photocopied it hung it off of buildings you've probably seen the Ronaldinho video uh, it, has everyone seen the Ronaldinho video Ronald, oh it's well, you can't see it because it's actually off the screen. Um, the Ronaldinho video was a, uh, a video. Was it staged? Was it non-staged? It was staged. Uh, but the purpose of the uh, video was meant to show the um, accuracy of the shoe. We, he bounced the ball off the cross beam, bounced it back, bounced it back. Interesting note, this video was actually attributed with being one of the major uh, builders and traffic drivers for YouTube in its infancy. Uh, and then widgets, of course, right? Bring, how, do you bring, how do you make your brand a utility and bring it out to where people are? Now, I want to make an important distinction for us because a lot of brands uh, 
back to that checklist. I need a social network. I need a uh, location base. I need a mobile strategy. It's sort of, there's what we believe is that brands have a voice. And that voice is actually incredibly important in this sea of opportunity and chaos. That brands are, uh, while there is a thirst for the new, that brands still stand as these lighthouses. They, they mean something. There's a reason why you keep drinking Coke when there's uh, a new product available every single day. So what we try to do is say, curate. Think about what your brand would and wouldn't do. What, what does it make sense for your brand to do? And that's why I pulled back the uh, store. Here, Nike Plus, Nano, Music While You Run, iTunes Store, makes sense to me. A lot of people go on there to load music. There's actually a podcast of techno beats at 140 beats per minute, 160 beats per minute, 175, depending on how fast you run. This makes sense. I encounter Nike in a way that makes sense. By contrast, uh, you, can, you can lay it on thick. There's a lot of wonderful metaphors here. Um, Heinz and Josh talked about this briefly uh, yesterday. Heinz Ketchup did the um, drop my pants and tell me what my brand is strategy, uh, which you'll find all over YouTube. There's, in fact, an entire contest channel on YouTube where users can um, submit their suggestions, uh, submit their videos, and you've got uh, Samsung's up there right now. Um, Heinz continues to be up there. Uh, there are, any, at any given time, there's about seven or eight brands begging you to, to, to tell them what their brand means. And my favorite was Heinz, Heinz actually had the gall. We'll, we'll po he, I'm sorry, that it didn't resolve. Oh, there, we'll post the top 15 on our website and America will vote. Because Lord knows, as soon as we're done talking, you're going to rush to the Heinz website to see what everybody had to say. I, boggling. And the, yeah. America will vote. I, I, I was really impressed by that. Um, this, sorry? Oh, choking. Um, uh, so I can get help. Uh, the social extension uh, bit, we talk about you saw what I was showing you in terms of presence, the idea that your so, what it means to be social is being redefined. Uh, and this uh, lovely virtually illegible slide I owe to Josh, who actually showed it to me for the first time, it is a, sort of a sargasso sea of Web 2.0 company logos. Uh, some good, some not so good. Uh, but what links those all is that, in effect, those are social tools. Uh, social search is the one that I really pop a lot. The concept of a rolio where you and 10 of your friends, you, you basically have a search engine uh, that's dependent on your friend list. And so if, I, if Mark were to type in black flag uh, and his friends uh, were to type in black flag, if he were the first of his friend group to type black flag, up comes the uh, pest killer uh, and then up comes the band. If he clicks on the band, then when all his friends search, the band's going to come up higher because the social search engine is recognizing that group think in term, and, and trying to determine what interests might be relevant for them. So there are lots of buckets here uh, in the social extension, private networks, communities of interest, immersive 3D environments, uh, the whole open ID uh, movement, uh, social currency and reputation and social search. So these are all bits that we're looking at. Uh, and the immersive experience front, I, I just freaking love this photosynth. If you, if you haven't had a chance to see it, I will bore you with it for hopefully only two seconds. Okay. So what this is, ha, ha, show of hands, who's seen photosynth? Okay, so I will bore you guys. Please bear with me uh, just a few seconds. Uh, what makes it so freaking cool uh, is that you can upload. What it does is goes to Flickr. It pulls down photos based on a geographic location, physical location, in this case, uh, Piazza San Marco in St. Venice. In, in Venice. Uh, it then does a reverse algorithm to determine the point from which the photo was taken based on you know, sort of the angles and, and, and lines. It then position those, positions those photos in this virtual space, in, a, in an actual sort of 3D environment. So what you're seeing, those white dots, are actually the keyframes uh, for the photos. And so what you get is this 3D uh, environment comprised of a thousand photos taken by a thousand different people at a thousand different times, different weather conditions, uh, you name it. And these are high quality images. I mean, what's, what's amazing is you can actually zoom in, and I, I, don't, I don't know who these people are, but I love them. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so you, you literally can wander around this entire uh, space and you can just sort of mouse over and see all the individual photos and the amount of resolution is amazing. So when we talk about immersive experiences, we're talking about more than video games, although video games are certainly um, in that pool. Oh, this is a fun one. We also look at immersive experiences that uh, play with the paradigm. This uh, website, this blog, was launched for a movie in Spain, actually. Uh, now, it's, it's a little tough to pick up because uh, the, the text is, is white on the black, but what they've done is they've adopted, similar to what uh, Marie Digby did in adopting the YouTube uh, visual aesthetic, this company had the uh, challenge that the same weekend that this movie was opening up, uh, Apocalypto was opening up, uh, Night at the Museum was opening up, and the uh, Will Smith, um, uh, the Will Smith movie with his kid, Pursuit of Happiness, thank you. So all those films were opening up at the same time. And these guys were like, well, what do we do? Well, we want to get bloggers talking about this film. We think that that will help us uh, push this thing. So what they did was they created this blog. And the neat thing was if you went onto Google search and you typed in, I want to see a ghost, this blog would pop up. And what it does, all the genre elements are nailed. There's the image of the blogger. Uh, it looks a little uh, emaciated, but there he is. Uh, recent comments, there's the archive. Here's the blog ring. You can sign up for the RSS feed. Here's the, uh, the most recent entries. Now, what's really neat and virtually impossible to see from where you are is that this lead entry here with the heading Suicide Wave, uh, no matter when you arrive on this website, on this blog, uh, one of the neat things about blogging is you, you can also see when the most recent post was put up. It, th this post was 10 minutes before you arrived. So it's actually capturing that and, and incorporating that into the site. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize in advance. This is not a pretty video, so bear with me. Assuming that it actually launches, of course. Come on. Buffering. Boy, imagine if I, I still remember 4.7 4. baud modems. Remember those things? Like, size of this bag. Good God. And now here we are on the Ethernet and it's a much different experience. <laughs> there we go. Can we, is it possible to bring the lights down a little bit? No? Yes. Brilliant. Uh, sound? Can we bring the sound up? Okay. Now, as you're on the site, a new post is coming up. Don't watch the video. Don't watch the video. Please don't watch the video. Post. In case you're wondering, you're fucked. Help me. It's, yeah, thank you. Pulse uh, opened up at the theater, second only to Night at the Museum. So when we talk about immersive experiences, there's actually a lot you can do. This one, and I'm not going to uh, launch it right now because I know we're probably running uh, a little short on time. This is a website that was developed to explain drugs uh, and how you, how, well here was the challenge. If you go to uh, uh, MySpace, MySpace launched a uh, anti-drug campaign with I, I think uh, 411 information and some government resources and you go there and it's exactly what you'd expect. Here's the page, if you're doing these drugs, here's the information about it, here's resources for help. Uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that if I'm a kid with a drug problem, I'm probably not hanging around and, and experiencing that. And so the challenge for the agency that, that did this work, uh, pro bono actually, uh, was how, 
how to create the experience of being on drugs without giving you a drug. How do you teach people why drugs are bad when this is such a nebulous concept? Uh, if I haven't done a drug, how do I know how bad it is? Why not just try it and see whether it's bad? Oh, I'm hooked! So here they created this website, uh, trydrugs.net. Uh, and what happens when you go there is the uh, actual uh, browser experience, it phases through a series of experiences. And what happens is your, your mouse control uh, is impacted by the drug. So w with marijuana, marijuana dulls the brain. You, when you move your mouse, the mouse drags behind. It doesn't, it doesn't quite catch up. And, and the text blurs a little. It's too hard to read. And it takes a little while, but finally you, you click through it. And then the next one is um, cocaine. And on cocaine, the mouse goes really fast and it jumps ahead of you. You can't get it. And it, it, in the text, it says, uh, you know, paranoid. And you start along the lines of that ghost when you start hearing, it, it starts playing voices and people are talking. And, and in the part of the paranoia, it then launches a fake email browser saying that drug-related activity is taking place. And then it says uploading sent to, and you're like, ah! What's going on? And when you try to get the mouse over to the next button, it jumps, it moves around, you can't catch it. You're like, ah! It's wonderful. So it's just using the experience. This is what gets really interesting about the interactive medium. A lot of people think, oh, it's a website, or oh, it's a banner, or oh, it's a social network widget, or, but it's more than that. It's how do you create emotionally engaging experiences? How do you tell stories? How do you, how do you connect with people? This is a fun one. I'm going to see if, uh, if it's working on the computer. This is actually a hometown uh, company. This is called Immersive. Uh, What's fun about this is it's actually a, a 360 degree camera. You can look around. You probably remember uh, those, the, you know, the donut cameras from a couple of years back where you could look at the inside of a car, uh, right? And, and the images were knit together. What this is doing is it's actually knitting together live footage all around you. You can look. You can see what these people are doing. You can actually zoom in on them, which I won't do, uh, just looking at this crowd. Um, but what's neat is uh, the, camera, the camera can actually move. You can get linear uh, narratives happening uh, all around uh, you, and you can actually eavesdrop. You can hear people talking, and you don't always like what you hear. But it's incredible from a storytelling standpoint. I mean, imagine you've got the commercial, the sort of standard commercial. Again, the, the dinosaur rising from the sludge. You've got this commercial, which used to be a, a roller coaster ride from start to finish, and you were done, and you, you, you get out, you lose a finger. But this, the idea is that you can actually have uh, multiple interweaving narratives. Imagine a, a, a movie where no one's ever off camera, because you can look around. The guys back at the ranch over at Widen were like, God, we want to shoot a horror movie with this, because imagine. The, the experience you have, and the other neat thing is you get, you, they have a set of glasses. You can do what I'm doing with, with the mouse, but you can actually wear the glasses and everybody can look their own way. So now imagine the horror movie where you hear the creak behind you and half the audience turns around and sees somebody and screams and you're looking over the other side going, don't look back because you know the murderer is there and it's kind of a wonderful thing. Uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, immersive. It's actually a, a company right here in town. Mobility, uh, huge, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but there's a thousand different aspects to it. And it used to be that mobility, in the US, we have a very uh, specific view of it because the carriers have told you what mobility is for the longest period of time. And if you wanted to try to experience anything beyond that uh, carrier delimited experience, you had to go off deck, which was uh, somewhat akin to um, sailing your ship off the end of the earth back in the 1400s. There was a little process. You had to know what you were doing. Now things are opening up. Uh, we look at all these different components, but I think the, the big point that I want to pop are the two at the top, the idea of the humanode and the idea of brand immediacy. Um, what mobile has really done is it, it's eliminated the gap uh, between what I say as a brand and what I deliver as a brand. And the example that we use is uh, Hurricane Cole. Has, has, have you guys seen the Hurricane Cole uh, experience? So Cole's um, department store has a website with a wonderful brand statement. It says, we guarantee a, a wonderful shopping experience, clean all the time, uh, family-friendly environment. And then what happened was uh, somebody went into a Cole's that was, you know, was after, clearly after a sale, so it wasn't, I don't think this person was being fair. But they walked in and they just snapped pictures. And it was a mess, a dump. 
And what they did was they created a slideshow with those images and then took the text off of Cole's website and transposed that with the images. It was just mean. Uh, but, but what it does is, it, again, it, it gives you the, the sense that, that that barrier has disappeared. So now, question for the audience. Who do you think the three most interesting mobile companies are right now? What? Uh, who? What? Helio. Helio. Okay. Any Helio and Korean companies? Man, we're <laughs> mobile in the mobile land. Did I hear Google? Google. I'll, I'll walk you through the three that we're focused on. Nokia, clearly a client, Apple, and Google. I don't include a carrier in that right now. Carriers are desperately fighting to save a business model. Um, I think the carriers are probably six months away from being the RIAA uh, of their day. That these companies, uh, Google especially, uh, Google and Nokia are sort of kind of Paralleling, and again, I'm not just saying that because Nokia is a client. Nokia uh, is making a transition from being a manufacturer to being an experience. Google has always been a bit of an experience, and they are the amount of stuff that Google is doing the acquisition of Android, the Nevin Vision acquisition, the Grand Central acquisition, um, the uh, recent uh, concessions they got during the FCC band spectrum auction. Uh, their move into what they're calling white space. I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the. Uh, attempt to capture TV analog unused spectrum and use that. So they're hitting it at all points. It's really interesting. Social currency is a big one for us. Um, this one came up with Old Spice, uh, a recent campaign, where the client actually wanted us to use um, Bill Murray uh, to be the voice of experience. And we went on to uh, Facebook and found over 160 uh, fan groups dedicated to Bruce Campbell, and if anybody has seen uh, Evil Dead, uh, Army of Darkness, far too passed over at Oscar time, um, he, is, he is a cult phenomenon, and it was actually interesting. Josh had this point where he was saying, Bruce Campbell and Evil Dead is sort of your older brother. It's the older brother phenomenon. You, you, you saw it with, with them. They recommended it to you. It was cool because they were uh, watching it, which was exactly the brand voice we were trying to get across. Axe is out in the marketplace selling their product, saying, get laid. We were trying to use Old Spice and say, we're about experience. These, these are the prepubescent kids wandering around who are making fart jokes, and the, this, this is the voice of experience. So Bruce Campbell made a lot of sense for us. So social currency is incredibly important uh, for us. So we look in the online space, there's a thousand and one uh, forms of social currency from your Twitter friend lists to the badges that you place on your social networking page to uh, the gifts section on Facebook. If, if, has, what the hell is that? <laughs> gifts on Facebook. It's the little graphics you got to buy and you can give them to your friends and people are buying them and they're giving them to their friends. They've created somewhere in the neighborhood, I've heard double digit millions uh, that they've generated in revenue from people just sending a graphic. And so here we, there's the obligatory Starbucks. We want to be able to send a cup of coffee to a friend. Uh, and then story dwelling. This, this concept, uh, it, uh, many of these are related. These aren't uh, you know, sort of isolated silos because story dwelling becomes a reflection of um, presence. Uh, mobility, uh, a, a lot of different pieces. This was snakes on a plane, which you heard uh, a little about yesterday. But what you may not have known about was snakes on a phone. <laughs> I, I asked a friend, uh, what was the most successful uh, mobile campaign to date in America? And his friend, he, without a hesitation, snakes on a phone. It's like, well, I knew a little bit about it. If, if anybody did it uh, or received it, it was the ability you go uh, online, you type in, you make a couple of selections, and then Samuel Jackson calls uh, the mobile phone number that you type in and gives a customized message, which is hilarious. If you, did anyone get one? Hands for who? Nice. <laughs> I love you. Um, so guess how many of those phone messages were sent? How many would you guess? Three million? Three million. More. Oh, darn. You know, see, now the number doesn't sound as good. Four million. Four million messages. I should have gone with the three million. You were, you were there. Thank you. Um, 
Four million uh, calls were forwarded around. And while the uh, results haven't been exactly tracked to date, the belief is that that mobile campaign actually was enormously successful in driving interest uh, in the film. A second uh, campaign I'm showing here was the Volkswagen campaign, uh, which was done, f I'm sorry? No, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> For anybody who, this was the uh, Unpimp Your Ride campaign. They were, they were trying to go with the uh, German austerity. And so the, the commercials you may have seen was them crushing uh, tuner vehicles and replacing it with the beauty of German engineering. And what was wonderful was you had banner units that, uh, this, this pinball banner, when you pulled it back, it would fire across. And, and all of a sudden, the car would shoot across what seemed like multiple websites uh, horizontally. It was a really neat uh, experience. There's uh, Helga ringtones which I had for a little while, um, and she calls out from your pocket, it's definitely sucking, uh, which shouldn't be being called out from your pocket. Um, and you, you, she appeared at events, and what they did was they created an entire immersive brand experience that you went through. And what was interesting about this is, you're, you're like, well, what, okay, cutouts at, a, at, a, at an event, what, what, how does that factor into the interactive? Taking a step back, we look at interactive as, um, almost a connective tissue. It's a way to link uh, these pieces together. And the best example uh, that I've got from that one is the Nine Inch Nails uh, Year Zero uh, album release. So this, I'm a huge Nine Inch Nails fan. Uh, also uh, heavy metal, Mark, Mark, yeah. Um, so what you're seeing here, uh, Trent Reznor, hey, genius, uh, was in uh, Europe on tour. Uh, for his uh, uh, tour, <laughs> and uh, on it on the back, it sort of adopts standard format, just like the Ghost movie used the blog format. Here, Trent used the standard T-shirt, and while it's a little hard to pick out, some of these letters are high lit white. There's a few of them. You can see the M in Manchester and the the N in Netherlands. And what happened was uh, a group of fans got together and they realized that when you took these uh, jumbled letters and combined them, they formed a URL. That URL took you to this bucolic looking website, the barn, the fields, America born again, it said. But when you rolled your mouse over it, it revealed this blasted, dystopian, uh, decaying wasteland. So Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> um, and what happened was that was the first of what, what I believe the number is between 13 and 15 uh, websites. You sort of went on this wonderful uh, um, fan sort of interaction. They, they banded together. It was actually what, what we call an ARG, or an alternate reality uh, gaming experience. And so the, what happened was all the fan boards lit up on Nine Inch Nails, people sharing information. Have you seen this website? People opening up the source code to understand what was underneath it and finding the clues there to find the next website. On and on this went. It included video uh, and audio clips on YouTube. This was the hand of God descending down, which you can actually still see if you go to YouTube. There's an audio track of a sniper at a baseball game. And what is amazing about all this, and a little disconcerting from, uh, from an agency side, is I look at this, and to me, the websites, the YouTube videos, all this could have been shot in an afternoon. The, the, the actual websites never get deeper than a page or two or three. The audio clips, um, they do images. It's sort of like After Effects stuff, it's just a couple of pictures, but with a nice uh, audio track, which clearly Trent had access to a recording studio. Uh, and some videos, which are just fun. Was, it, was his fingers trembling? He, he may well have been, just like Marie Digby. Um, but what this all led to was a, um, a, 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 an opportunity for an actual real world experience. And this is where it gets really twisted and awesome. Uh, they, they allowed you to enter your information on a website. A lot of information, a lot of personal information you had to supply. And it was for the opportunity to participate at an event. Uh, and the, the event is rumored to have been in Los Angeles. So what I'm telling you is, is what we found through blogs and people talking about it, because I, I haven't yet found an image of this. But what happened was the people arrived uh, at a predetermined location in Los Angeles on a street corner. And there were a lot of people, a couple, couple hundred people, uh, nondescript corner. Up pulls a fleet of buses. Up pulls a fleet. I was supposed to tell her that I see her standing there with the 10 minutes. Um, up pulls a fleet of buses with tinted windows. 
everyone climbs dutifully onto the buses. What they find when they get into the buses is you can't see outside. It's double tinted. The buses roll out, wander around the neighborhoods for a little while. Nobody has any freaking clue where they're going, but it's still, you know, kind of fun. Hey, we're all Nine Inch Nails fans. Yeah, you know, did you torture animals? Yeah, I did too. So they all kind of cruise uh, along until they arrive at a warehouse. Doors open up, out issue the people from the buses into this warehouse. Uh, again, what's interesting here is nobody's questioning anything. They're just, oh, this is a fun sort of little game. They get into the warehouse, the doors close behind them, and they lock audibly. Now people are like, ha, 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 maybe I shouldn't have tortured animals. And at, at one end of the uh, warehouse is a stage, and so they're like, oh, well, this must be the, the concert that, that we're going to go attend. And so they all sort of move towards it. And what happens is out on the stage marches this guy in Gestapo uniform. And he just starts yelling at them. How could you give that information? You've given so much personal that we could kill you right now. No one knows that you're in this warehouse. Just going off. Oh, people are like, oh, going crazy. <laughs> Into the room comes security. The doors burst open. SWAT team comes in and pushes everybody. Everybody's going back, ah, shrieking, ah, down the stairs to the basement. Where? Trent gives a concert. Six songs set. Everybody's relieved. Oh, yay, it's Trent Reznor. You know, lighters come out. And here's the year zero. Uh, Bang, in comes security again. This time with smoke grenades, everybody running, screaming out into the, the, the LA sun, blinking. Ah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and you think about it, none of the components of that campaign were anything other than what a normal album release would have. Promotional website, pre-release track, secret concert. But what they did, what Trent did, they created an, a completely immersive environment which was consistent back to that presence. Every piece of it was consistent with the Nine Inch Nails sort of world vision, terrifying as that is. So this, and um, we're, we're close, we're, we're almost there. Um, so I have a website, I have a blog that I call Ouroboros. And the reason why I call it Ouroboros is that from my standpoint, a lot of what we're seeing from a technological standpoint uh, is re-emergent technology, not emergent technology, or more specifically, re-emergent cultural trends being facilitated by technology. So for instance, social networking. This is new. No one's ever social networked before. Here's Twitter with the 15 idiots who are following me who get my updates whenever I put them up. Here's Facebook. And if, uh, I'm sorry, there are, I believe some of the idiots are here and I love you. Uh, please don't kill me. Um, here's my Facebook page with my 137 friends and my news feed and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Er, step back. The original social network, remember it? It was called the phone. And what's interesting about a phone is not the phone itself, but the network capacity of the phone, the ability to connect other people. Think about it this way. Facebook and MySpace are only as useful as, as you have friends on them. Otherwise, you're just sitting there, just like a telephone. Imagine a time when you could pick up the phone and call somebody and they didn't have a phone. Can you even imagine that time? Well, now think of the same uh, vigor with which you declaim on your coworkers who don't have a Facebook page. How can you not be on Facebook? Everybody's on Facebook, MySpace, ba 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 ba. Point one. <laughs> Point two, blogs. New phenomenon, people talking about ideas. Funny, I remember that. Uh, Thomas Paine, you, you had pamphleteers. Thomas Paine, one of the original zine ophiles. Uh, uh, Tom Paine, uh, punk rocker, uh, do it yourself, anarchist, uh, anti establishment. Punk rock, colonial. We have it in our roots. So, what's wonderful about this stuff is that anybody can do it. What's challenging about this stuff is that anybody can do it. And I was trying to, um, I was talking to uh, some of the friends, and I was, I was describing interactive like riding a bicycle. Because I can describe uh, interactive to you. Clive Thomas in Wired was talking about Twitter and uh, the sort of emergence of proception, the idea of social proception, that the individual tweet that you get is, is irrelevant, trivial, banal for the most part, but by having uh, hundreds of them accumulating all your friends, you start to develop almost an extrasensory perception about where your friends are and what they're doing. 
proprioception, you know, so you know where your hands and, and feet are. Um, but in it, he said, you can't understand Twitter unless you're Twittering. Because every time, and I, will, I can vouch for this, every time I tell people about Twitter, like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Who cares? 140 character limit. What? In God's name. And I had this moment. I, I also was sort of in that school. I have to do it because I need to understand it because I might need to synthesize it and translate it for, for Brent. And then I, I was, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I climbed a mountain. It happened to be the wrong mountain I thought I was climbing, but I climbed a mountain. And I'm standing on top of it and I'm completely alone. Dumb. Bad idea. And I'm standing there and I'm like, God, this is wonderful. Here I am on top of this mountain, and the view is beautiful. And, and all of a sudden, I was like, well, this would be a good tweet. <laughs> this would be a good tweet. Because a Twitter, a twi when you tweet, the question that, you, that you're asked is, what are you doing right now? And my phone didn't work. And I was tearing my fucking hair out. It still hasn't gone down. I was, I was freaking out. I was like, finally, I've got something worth Twittering. And all the tweets I get from my friends, like my cat's asleep, uh, uh, the burrito wasn't good. Uh, you know, and here I was, I climbed a mountain. I was like, Gah! And I knew that the poetic irony of it was that I couldn't go down to the bottom of the hill and say I, I'm on top of a mountain because I wasn't doing it when I do the entry. And it was the first time I actually had a visceral connection to that technology. Technology. So the bike analogy again, I, I, it, when, I've got a kid, five-year-old, who I'm actually teaching to ride a bike right now. And I can't, you can't describe riding a bike. I can tell you everything about riding a bike. All it'll do is freak you out, because you know you're going to fall down. The fear is there. But once you get on a bike and you start moving, well, you've got it. But that raises an interesting question. Because if the entire landscape is now open, anybody can tweet, anybody can blog, anybody can post, anybody can edit uh, uh, Wikipedia, anybody, anybody can participate. It's called participatory media for a reason. But though anyone can bike, not everyone's going to be Greg Lamont. There is, we believe, still room for brands to play a curatorial role, to help define experiences in what is becoming a wildly diverse landscape, and for agencies to help find those ideas that help connect with uh, consumers. This was a wonderful quote from Influx Insights, and that they get to fucking call it an insight, to me is wonderful. Quite simply, every advertiser with an 18 to 29 demo should be using online video. Ooh. Uh, how, they creative how they creatively break through is another challenge. Yeah. <laughs> So I use this slide because um, that, that bit presents it so rationally. But what we find in advertising is you can't reason your way into somebody's heart. And that's what you're trying to do with a brand. You're trying to find a place to engage with them. These people are not reasoning their way to the bed and breakfast back there. <laughs> they're overcome with passion. They feel passion. They are in, they're engaged with each other. And they, there's danger that they could even more engage with each other, clearly. So what is the agency's role? Summarize it into three things. Um, one, what the agencies do is we help brands find their voice. It's what we've always done. That's what a good agency theoretically does, is it cuts through all the stuff that they've got, all the different product lines, all the different things, and you find what that brand means. It's enormously reductive to say, if a brand was a person, what would they do? But it, the analogy is there. The second thing we do is we come up with ideas based on that voice. If this is what you're trying to do, if this is what you're trying to sell, here's an idea that's consistent with you that's a way to do it. And then the third thing that we do is we develop relationships. If you look at our, uh, the Winding Kennedy materials, we, we, we create provocative relationships with consumers. And that's not hitting you in the face and being like, woo, you know, scary provocative. It's meant to engage in a conversation. But that last bit is the point actually that I started off on, which is that those relationships are as important uh, with uh, external people as, as much as they are internal.